question. So I'm a biophysicist. Um, once upon a time, I used to do quantum things, but this is a little side project that turned into much more than a side project, mostly because of these three people up here, Marin, who's a postdoc at Berkeley, Dries, who's now a postdoc at Harvard, and with us, and my student, Alex Day. And uh, the joke always me, between me and Tolia, who's the other senior author on this, is that uh, if I'm the coach, he's the cheerleader. So I really, this is the first time I really felt like a senior author. And so what I'm going to tell you about is some crazy idea that came out of a stupid comment I made two years ago at a thesis defense where I was sitting at a quantum control thing and I was like, why don't you guys just reinforcement learn all this stuff? And that turned into this kind of long expedition of us learning reinforcement learning and then realizing that in quantum control there might be some really interesting, uh, and in just in control problems in general, there might be some really interesting, uh, interesting, uh, interesting uh, connections with spin glass physics. And so what I'm going to try to tell you, the point of this talk is to basically say, there's all these large class of non-equilibrium physics problems. They can be in biology, they can be in quantum mechanics, and in these non-equilibrium settings, we don't really have very many tools to analyze them. And just like Gotham was telling you yesterday, one promising approach of doing this is trying to train agents that can solve these non-equilibrium problems, and then learn from the kind of solutions they find, and try to get insights into non-equilibrium physics. So this is going to be basically uh, uh, an example of this program in the context of trying to control quantum systems. So before I go on, uh, yeah, that's our little robot. Um, so before I go on, I, I was on sabbatical last year, and I wrote this ridiculously long review with a bunch of people who are also involved in this work, which is 120 pages with 86 figures, and I really regret wasting my sabbatical on it, but I hope it's useful for your students and for other people. A lot of what I did was basically go through a lot of papers and try to synthesize the dogmas of machine learning, because that's what they are, they're dogmas, no one really has very many rigorous results, and, and basically create a dictionary translating physics to machine learning and back and forth. And so there's, uh, there, there, the first half of it is standard supervised learning, but uh, the second half is what I find much more interesting, which is unsupervised learning. And, uh, and uh, there's 20 Python notebooks that go along with it, for, uh, and they teach you all the major packages, like PyTorch, uh, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, blah, blah, blah. So it's really meant as a pedagogical exercise, mostly for students, for people who want to jump into this field with a little less pain than it took me to do. And, uh, and, and I try to synthesize what we, what we think is going on, though probably half the things I've written there are wrong, because I think it, it is what it is. So please make use of it so I don't feel like I wasted my whole sabbatical. If, if you have students who want to learn some stuff, please hand it to them. I'll really appreciate it. Um, so the second thing is that those of you who have talked to me know that I'm pretty much a skeptic. I think everything is not going fast enough. But um, like four years ago, me and my friend David Schwab wrote this, what I would call hopeful note, saying, oh, maybe there's some relationship between deep learning and, very, and RG. And we were really disappointed with the paper because we couldn't do anything practical with it at all. It, it really was hard. And at the end, we had this kind of crazy paragraph where it said, recently it was suggested that modern RG techniques such as TensorFlow, I mean, such as Mira's and matrix product states might be interesting for deep learning, and maybe we can use deep learning to do quantum things, but we're too stupid to really know how to do it. Maybe some smarter people will come along. And so the thing that I enjoyed about this conference is that there's so many people who are smart people, at least smarter than us, who have like really take, taken this research program on and done some amazing things. And so maybe I shouldn't be so skeptical that oh, everything is going to shit in science. You know, we're mad at it, and maybe we'll make some hope. So, 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 so in that way, I really enjoyed this conference because there's, you know, it, it, it's fun to see that, like, things that seem so flightful and wistful just four years ago, there's really smart people and teams of people working on it. And it's not saying that we did it. I'm just saying it's just funny. It's just, to me, a landmark of how far the community and collectively people have made progress in just four years ago when this just really seemed like fancy of flight to me and David. All right, so on to the main part of the talk. So the main part of the talk that we're going to I'm going to tell you about is uh, quantum state preparation. So quantum state preparation is just basically how do I start with one quantum state and end up in another quantum state by manipulating uh, manipulating some control parameters I have. These can be magnetic fields, these can be other things, and this is you know a central problem in you know in preparing Bose-Einstein condensates or in quantum computing with squids or NB centers. And in principle, quantum machine learning, though 
we're not quite sure. We can never make sense of that literature. But in all, in all, all I mean, in, in the sense that what's going on, but in all these things, what you have to be able to do is you have to be able to require complicated quantum states in a robust manner and relatively quickly. And so the problem we got interested in was uh, you have some quantum system in an initial state. You time evolve it for some time t, and this t is going to play a really, really important rail, a role in everything that's going on. And you end up with some final state psi t. Right? So it seems simple enough, and the important point is that this Hamiltonian is time dependent with some control fields. And my goal is to like basically control these control fields. And so, as I said, the basic idea is given some constraint, and you'll see that the central thing we're going to try to talk about is that this it very much looks like a constraint satisfying. We're going to try to argue by, I'm going to try to argue to you by the end that this is very much a constraint satisfaction problem. So given some constraint, in this case time, determine the Hamiltonian HT such that the overlay, overlap of my final state is maximal with some target state, which I'm going to call psi star. So that's, that's the problem. And the question is, how hard is this problem? How well can we do it? And we really, there's going to be some words I use. There's going to be the fidelity, which is just the overlap between these things. It goes between 0 and 1. There's the evolved state, which is the state I get at the end of all this thing. And there's the target state. So those, those, are, the only, those are the words I'm going to use. Uh, remember the fidelity, because that's going to be what's going to be really important. And there's going to be a time t. That, that, that's going to play an important role in all of this stuff. And so you, know, we, you can do this for many, many systems. Uh, here we're going to focus on just a simple qubit system where you can, you can control a single transverse field, Sx. You can't control Sy. And many body systems. So one of the things we were curious about is how well can you do this for a many body system? This is just a transverse field Ising model where I get to control a single global field, Hx of t. And so the game is essentially to try to prepare complicated states of these systems. And so at first we didn't really you know, know how to do this. There were some, uh, well, we did know how to do it for a single qubit system pretty easily. And, 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 and Anatoly and Dries were working on a bunch of techniques using some really interesting ideas called counter-adiabatic driving. And I was like, why don't we just machine learn it? We can beat everything you do. I bet you we can. And so we made a lot of bets and did a lot of stuff. And so we started on this kind of crazy path of trying to reinforcement learn this thing. And so just so, I, and many of you might be familiar with this, but this is reinforcement learning in a nutshell. So the basic idea is you have an agent, you have an environment, and the important thing is that the agent can take actions that change the environment. So you have this agent, you have this environment, so you have some states, which we'll call the RL states, which describe the state of your control device. In this case, it will just be time and the magnetic field I'm applying. And you have some available actions. In this case, I can change my field. I can have either continuous actions or discrete actions. It doesn't really matter for this thing. And you get some reward function. And the reward is going to be after I evolve this state for a time t, I'm just, someone's going to tell me back the fidelity. And so I just kind of, we, for those of you who know, we do some crazy variant of Q-learning. It's nothing standard. We spent a long time working out how to do this Q-learning. And part of my frustration is we have no place to, uh, to publish it, even though I think it's quite general. It might be interesting. And so the goal is, in Q-learning is to maximize the expected reward. And, and so the basic way it goes like this. In our case, the environment is just the Hamiltonian and the Schrodinger equation. The reward, again, as I point out, is the fidelity at time t. And so what you do is that you kind of start from some initial state, take some action, and then you go to a state one, and then you time, the, basically what happens is with this kind of field, the state time, uh, the, the, the quantum state that you're evol uh, evolves, then you calculate the reward, which is then used to choose, update this Q function, after which you choose subsequent action, uh, uh, actions, and you just kind of keep doing this over and over again, right? So you do this over and over again, you try random stuff, and at the end of it, you get the time t, the episode is completed, you find out what your fidelity is, you update this q function, and you do it all over again. So what, yeah, go ahead. Oh, the q function has these kind of funny two-time things, the way we use the state space, the kind of tilings we do, the way we have to do these updates, because of the way 
this kind of, it's very historical, so the thing that makes this problem hard, it's very his, historetic, is that we do some kind of funny thing with Thailand. I don't know how much you know, but I can tell you offline. But we, we do some funny kind of double update with kind of like a, we separate out the time in the Q learning algorithm, the steps in the Q learning algorithm from physical time, which in most problems, they're the same thing. You assume that the steps in the Q learning algorithm are the same as the time in the physical system. And the idea is that those two don't have to be exactly the same. That, that's the essence of what's not standard about it. Um, so what, 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 what is difficult about this? Well, the state of possible actions is exponentially big. And so how does reinforcement learning roughly, uh, roughly solve this problem? Well, it basically performs some kind of biased Monte Carlo sampling. That's the essence of it. And you want to learn this bias in a clever way from doing state and reward actions. And so how do we choose actions? Well, I mean, the real dilemma in all this reinforcement learning is this uh, exploration exploitation dilemma, which basically says, how much should I exploit knowledge that I already have compared to exploring actions that I haven't taken before? Right, so there's always this basic idea, I know this, I might go to a local minima, so I'll do that, but on the other hand, there might be much, much better actions that are much further away. And since you only get your reward at the end of the whole episode, this becomes quite difficult. And that's called the credit assignment problem. And that's another thing you have to think about. How do you assign credit to these things? And so uh, for everything I'm going to show you, because I'm really interested in relating this to spin glasses and trying to understand the phase space of control things, we're going to discretize our action space into two states. Actually, we've run this all with continuous action spaces. It doesn't make any difference, but it's hard to understand what's going on. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically say, I have a magnetic field, and it can be in two states. I either put it at some maximum h star, or at some minimum minus h star, and I just toggle my field back and forth between these. And this is kind of inspired by what in control theory is called bang bang protocols. And so what I'm going to do now is my, action, my, my, the, the, my basically actions now take the form of a vectors of 0 and 1. So these are Isaac spins, and that's the analogy we're going to use in a, section, in a second. And so after I do this, I can train this RL agent. So here's a little movie we made. Uh, and so what you have is you have this agent, and it's going to try random stuff out. And we just want to show you it learned because we found it amusing. Um, so it's a little slow. Let me see. Is it playing? Oh, maybe it's playing. Oh. OK, so here's what's happening. So this is the block sphere, for those of you who know, that's, that's basically how you could represent a qubit. The green thing is what, you know, is what the system is doing. The red arrow is the target state. And on the left is the entanglement entropy, on the right is the fidelity. The entanglement entropy has no role to play in this talk, though there's really interesting stories about entanglement entropy hanging out here. So this thing just starts trying stuff. So it's episode five. What's amazing is how quickly it learns to do stuff, to be honest. And you just keep trying different things. And you see, this is the reward it gets at the end of it, and it keeps updating its Q function, right? And already after 94 episodes, once you set up the Q function and the state and action variables right, you can learn these things pretty quickly. And so this black dotted line is something we got after looking at all these reinforcement learning protocols, looking at the solution, and we averaged it. You'll see that it has a clear geometric structure. It likes to go to the equator, precess around the equator, and then rotate back. And that's kind of like, it's like spin echo in NMR, if you, if you, if you think about it. You would want to, because the, you, there's a maximum speed that you can go, so you want to process to the center. So you keep doing this, you keep doing this, you know, this is episode 99, it's kind of okay, it's doing okay. You keep on going. And what, what's, what's really interesting is just you can watch it, and once you set up the state and action space right, that's the hardest part. How do I choose the state and action space? It learns to do this. And so I have a movie for many body if you want to do this, uh, if you want to see it. And there, what's interesting is that you, you increase the entanglement entropy and then go back down, which is kind of counterintuitive. But you keep on doing this. And you know, after a while, I'll speed it up to the end. You know, just keep getting better and better. right? And what's interesting, of course, is that it doesn't know it's solving a quantum mechanic problem. It could be solving any problem. So it doesn't know there's a block sphere underlying this problem. And yet it learns the geometry of the block sphere. So that's what we found 
really interesting. So you keep on doing this, solves this thing, and then after a while, you know, you you kind of basically learn to basically go to the equator and then go back up. And the reason you have these bangs is uh, the reason you have these kind of like oscillations here is because I've only allowed maximum and minimal fields. So it wants to make the field zero because it wants to let it process. So the best it can do is just average this thing. Just go boom, 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 boom. So it averages the zero. So so it was it was kind of incredible to us when we did this about now almost two years ago because a year and a half ago, because what was surprising to us is that you never told the reinforcement learning agent that it was solving a quantum problem. You never told it there was a geometry underlying this problem, which is the block sphere. And yet, very quickly, once you set up the state and action space right, you learned all these things. So we were, we were really surprised. And you can do a similar thing for many body systems. And there, the visualizations are a little bit trickier because you have also get, uh, you change the entanglement entropy and you have to do stuff. But you get very similar things. And recently, the first author of this thing went to Berkeley, and I told him I refuse to work on quantum things anymore because I'm a biophysicist. And so he's gone and now extended these kind of not kind of these RL things to these kind of very crazy non-equilibrium systems, which is the Kapitza pendulum, which is basically a pendulum you can invert by basically driving it really fast. And so what's interesting is you can do classical versions, quantum versions of this, and these RL agents learn how to control all these things. I should have put the reference down. It's just he just put it on the archive like a month ago. And so what it seems is that these reinforcement learning algorithms are really an interesting way to get at physics that we don't have access to right now, especially out of equilibrium. That's my hope. Right? And I'm running similar reinforcement learning with agents of you know, cellular populations that are trying to form patterns and things like that. And so, you know, all right, I showed you that some algorithm solves some problem, but who cares? Right? I mean, on some deep level, I'm a physicist. You know, it's cool that you can solve stuff, but I'm not an engineer. I'd like to understand what's going on. And so this is where I think the interesting thing about this physics and machine learning things is. Machine learning has to be a tool, a first step towards a deeper understanding. So the question I wanted to ask is, how hard is this, uh, how hard is this optimization problem? And all the results I'm going to show you here are largely going to be about many body problems, where I have you know, L coupled qubits. It turns out somehow L equals 6 is the thermodynamic limit. I don't, we don't understand where that number comes from, but it turns out that you can collapse lots of stuff after L equals 6. And what I'm going to, you know, what we did after we found this reinforcement learning thing is that we wanted to really understand the space of solutions. How hard was it to find the solution? Because we were really shocked. You know, when we saw these things, we were like, how did it find the solution? And then we thought, maybe this problem is actually really easy. Maybe it's really easy to find the solution. We don't know. And so what we did was we basically thought about analyzing these same things with many, many different algorithms. So what we did after RL was we analyzed these things with many, many different algorithms. And some of these algorithms have more information. They require more information than I get from RL agent. And so what we did is that we ran some kind of minimum stochastic descent to find local minima. So what we did is we start with some protocol, which remember is one and, ones and zeros. Then I basically propose a single flip, spin flip update. So I say, oh, let me change this third thing from an up to a down. And then I just basically greedily accept the update. So if the fidelity increases, accept it, and continue until you reach a local maximum of fidelity. Right? So all we're going to do is we're going to basically start in the space of protocols and greedily run downstream, downhill. So you just do that. You start in a different place. You run downhill. You go here. And what I'm going to show you for the rest of the talk is basically about the statistics of these minimum we encountered. So what I want to ask you about is what is the statistics of these minima that I see in this protocol space? And we're going to do it both, just so you know, for the... Oh. We're going to do it both for in what follows for what we'll call a single spin flip, but we're also going to do it again for two spin flips and three spin flips and four spin flips. Well, we can't do four. But we're, what I, all the data I'm going to show you is for a single flip, spin flip, but I can also do a slightly more non-local algorithm where I flip two things and ask, do I do better or not? And so I just basically go through, do this thing, and there's going to be two order parameters that are going to be really important, which are really adapted from spin glass literature. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to define what I'll call here a variance order parameter, where I look at all the minima, and I ask how variable are these local minima, right? So if they're all the same, the variance is zero, Q is equal to zero, and this is basically a convex problem. 
On the other hand, if they're all different, Q is going to be 1. Right? You have a, have a very large variance. The way this is normalized, I capped it off at 1. So this is just basically something like the Edward Anderson order parameter for those of you who know something about spin classes. A second order parameter that's going to be important for this thing, and it's not really an order parameter, but it's just a heuristic, let me call it that, is that I can now run this stochastic descent m times, and I can ask how many different minima do I find? What's the fraction of unique minima? And so, and so, um, you know, and, and so I can just count the number of unique minima. So it's basically telling you something about how many, what fraction of the time do I find a new minima? And so, using these things, we can basically just now make a phase diagram. And this is a phase diagram where the x-axis is the total time I have to prepare this state. The shorter the time is, the harder it is to prepare this thing. And so, what you can show is that rigorously now, is that there's something called the quantum speed limit, where below this time t equals 2.5, I cannot prepare a state with fidelity 1. But above that, I can prepare a state with fidelity 1. Then I can also plot this Q parameter, which is this variance order parameter. And what you see is that up to this time here, the variance is strictly zero. Then you go to this quantum speed limit, and it shows a kink, and it goes up. And so using this thing, we can basically think about three regions in this phase diagram. There's a convex phase, where there's a single global minima, but the minima is really, really bad. It has very low fidelity. Then you have this kind of correlated phase, we call it, where you have some different minima, and you still can't reach fidelity 1. And then you have the last phase, which we call the rugged phase, which is not really right, but it's just a controllable phase. So what you have is you have many, many, many minima, because the variance is high, that can all achieve this control transition. So it's just, it's just not that hard. After t equals 2.5, it's just basically an easy problem. And so you can do the same thing for the many-body phase diagram. So you can plot the fidelity. And the important point is that you never reach fidelity 1, so we think there is no controllable phase, though we can't prove that rigorously. And you can plot this Q1, and you have this convex phase again. And what's interesting is now you can plot this other order parameter we told you, which is the fraction of minima. And right here, you see that it kind of diverges. What's interesting next is that now instead of just thinking about a spin flip, single spin flip algorithm, you can think about a two spin flip algorithm. And what happens is the minima with respect to two spin flip behave very differently than they do with respect to one spin flip, right? And in this whole region here, where one spin flip it looks glassy, with respect to two spin flip it doesn't look glassy at all. So basically you had a bunch of minima that were just separated by one spin. And so you can do this again and plot all these things and you basically, once again, get three phases. So you get basically what we're calling a convex phase, a correlated phase and what we call a glassy phase. So let me try to argue for this glassy phase some more. So what's interesting here, to, as far as we were concerned, is that you have this very interesting transition as a function of the number of time and the kind of solutions you find to this optimal control problem. And so we really want, and, 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 and I think this is one of the fundamental things physics can offer, which is how do we understand the landscapes of solutions to these optimization and these machine learning problems. And so um, to understand this better, Whoops, sorry. To, do that. So, to try to understand the space of solutions better, I think the other thing we can do in physics is uh, we can adopt some of these nice data visualization techniques that people have developed in machine learning in the last 10 years. So here, you know, I'm going to show you a bunch of plots. They're used using this thing called TISNI, which I was surprised has not penetrated the physics community, even though it's the rage everywhere outside the physics community, where you take high dimensional data and you visualize it by doing a nonlinear projection. So on the left hand side, just to give you a sense of how well this works in certain settings, is that what I've done is I've taken a Gaussian mixture model in 40 dimensions. And what I've done is on the, on the left, this is just the first two coordinates, projection of the first two coordinates. Here is two random projections. Here is PCA. And here is TISNI. And TISNI is basically a nonlinear dimensional reduction. On the right, I've shown you the TISNI of the MNIST using a new fast Fourier transform implementation. That's amazing. By the way, if you want to use TISNI, you should use this new fast Fourier transform implementation. And you see that it can easily separate out all the digits in the MNIST thing in a completely unsupervised way. And this is somewhere where you can start visualizing complex solution space or complex landscapes. And it's actually, you know, they've got some bad rap on the, uh, uh, on the internet 
Twitter doesn't like Tisney, but I think most of those criticisms are mistaken. So you can do the same thing. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, there's no such thing of accuracy. I mean, what do you mean accuracy? Oh, it depends on the problem. Depends on the problem. Uh, it depends on how you cluster it. I mean, it depends on you use k-means, you use spectral clustering. It, 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 it depends a lot. It depends a lot on how you measure, measure error. We, I can show you. We have many, many. That's not a well-defined question. <laughs> It does, I mean, look, I believe I, roughly. It, it does, okay, it does good. It doesn't do badly. Yeah, no, I mean, it depends on how you quantify it. The F scores, if that means anything to you, is like 75%, 80%. Okay. Um, all right, so you can just, this is my last, last basic slide. Uh, the basic idea is now you can go back and remember this phase diagram, which it's not going to matter, but... Um, there's this phase diagram, and basically what we're going to look at is we're going to basically look at solutions in this glassy phase as we increase time. So the time is going to be a 2.3, 3, 3.5, and we're going to ask how do the solutions, the local minima that we find, change. And what's really interesting, on the top are these TISNI projections, on the bottom are basically Hamming distance between these protocols, and what you see is the solution space kind of clusters and then as you increase the time, these clusters kind of disappear. In the end, it looks like there's no clustering, which is true. But what happens is that these solution spaces all become equally far from each other. They just kind of are random. They basically have maximum distance from each other where you can find them. And none of these are optimal solutions, but they're all pretty good. So what's, what it turns out is in these problems, it's really hard to find the optimal solution. In fact, we are trying to have some proofs that show that infinite, these are NP hard problems. But finding a pretty good solution is almost trivial. And so, and so the question is how do we run into this manifold of pretty good solutions of which there are many? So there's been a lot of obsession with is this optimal, is that not optimal? But I think this kind of phase diagram thing is much more interesting in some very deep level because it turns out that there's lots and lots of very, very good solutions. And the space of solution is basically determined by the problem. In this case, the amount of time I have. And so I think there's some deep relationship between these kind of constrained optimization problems, KSAT, and the solution space of that, and these control problems where time now plays the role of constraint. And so we're really interested in thinking about that. I've stopped thinking about it in the quantum domain, but I am thinking about it in biophysics problems where there's a similar kind of thing, where you have to find things in optimal things. So uh, I think that's all I wanted to say. The conclusion is RL is an interesting paradigm for studying non-equilibrium physics. Uh, we think that quantum control and more generally control can be understood in the language of phase diagrams and phase transitions. Optimal solutions might be hard to find, but it's pretty easy to find a space of almost optimal solutions. How almost is defined is hard to say. But they also show interesting structures and constraints as you change the amount of time or some other constraint on the control. We find similar thing if you change any resource constraints. So we think there's resource constraints. As you change them, you're going to get these phase transitions where these solutions cluster. Um, and so, and we suspect for a large class of controls problems that these things are equivalent to a spin glass. And even though it's exponentially hard to find the optimal one, it's pretty easy to find these things. And we have some mapping to the Ising landscape and all these other things that I cut out. And so with that, I want to acknowledge these th my collaborators. Like I said, this is the most senior I've ever been on a project. I did try to troubleshoot some technical problems here and there, but the work was done mostly by Marin, my student Alex and Dries, and a lot of people gave me some money to let me think about random stuff, even though I'm a biophysicist and I'm grateful. Thank you.